Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be here and uh, certainly enjoyed my time with Warren and uh, Raylene last night. Um, brought along my bucket today because I think it's a, it's a very useful ministry prop. Warren, I think you, you, sh- you probably have one of these, but I think you can find a few metaphors in here um, that you might be able to use. And I'd like to start off uh, trying to get people thinking about mission in, in slightly different ways. And, and a bucket is a good way, because often we think of mission as, as starting with a bucket full of cash and resources, and taking those to others who are in need. And, and I think this is a good thing, because it's how we share resources uh, that we have in abundance. It's, it's how we express our, our thankfulness and gratitude for what we have. It's also an ethical thing, I guess, um, seeking to address some of the inequities in the world. Um, the other way you could think about it is is mission starting with an empty bucket and that's when people will go overseas or or somewhere far away and they'll they'll go with with an empty heart and and, an empty mind to seek to be filled with new experiences and to bring back something that they can share with their communities and that's that's also a very very good thing Uh, what I want to start with today is is the idea of turning the bucket upside down and I'll pop it here as a reminder as I speak because when we turn a bucket upside down we can put it in the dust and sit next to our neighbour. And so when we, when we sit down next to someone, when we listen to someone, or heard about the hands and feet and arms of God before, but um, God also has ears. And, and when we learn to listen to someone and to become a neighbour, we learn to hope for them. Uh, we, learn, uh, we learn about who they are and, and that's how we come to effectively serve them. This is also, um, I guess, the inspiration that we have in the gospel, the gospel that God comes to sit down beside us in the dust and and, uh, join with us in friendship and love. And that passage we heard from Paul, um, maybe I'll just go back to that quickly, also begins in a similar way. And and Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica, it's a very difficult word to say. Um, he's writing to the church there where he, he was involved with, with the initial growth and, and founding of that church. And he's reminding them what was the most important things uh, the, of, of the central purpose of his visit and the establishment of that church. And he says, we cared for you the, the way a mother cares for her children. We loved you dearly, not content just to pass on the message. We wanted to give you our hearts, and we did. And Paul's setting aside active concerns over what mission and ministry is. Acts is full of, the the book of Acts is full of all sorts of journeys and and adventures that, that the apostles go on. But here Paul's really pointing towards something that's bigger than just activity, mission that's bigger than our activities and bigger than heading out into the world just to do things. And Paul points to mission that begins in who we are as a quality and as a character, as sharing our hearts and caring for others as a nurse or a mother cares for her children. And I think if we start here, all the activities that we think about associated with mission just come out naturally. They overflow from these, uh, this character of God. Uh, all, our, all the activities of, of care and concern, of encouraging, of service, these all overflow out of the character of God. So that's the image that I want to uh, begin to introduce to you today. It's a bit loud, isn't it? Um, and I'll, what I want to do is just share a little bit about uh, the work of, of Global Mission Partners and Churches of Christ collectively, um, as we're able to do, and also share a brief message uh, with you on the theme of, of courage and mission after I do that. First of all, thank you for your ongoing support um, regularly through a, through a monthly donation to our work. Um, that does go to um, our church, the church side of our work rather than the relief development side of our work. Um, so I'll share a little bit about the sorts of projects that that support goes to, um, as well as, the, I guess, the long-term relational connection, especially through Ted, uh, Ted Gray and now Joy, 
Um, it's fantastic to see their energy and involvement in some of our work in Papua New Guinea. Um, Global Mission Partners is a, um, an organisation of Churches of Christ and I guess our main aim is to connect people to uh, the partners with whom we work in, in other places around the world, 12 countries and in all, including Indigenous Australia. And the church side of our work, evangelism, church planting, leadership development, all these things begin with this ethos of getting along beside others. We take that very seriously. Um, a lot of the places we've been working, we've been uh, connecting through the churches across in Australia to these locations for over 125 years. And these relationships are really sustained by the people within our churches, um, like Ted and Joy. Um, it's great to hear, I spoke to them on the phone last week, and it's a pity they couldn't be here today, but great to hear their um, obvious energy and enthusiasm um, for, for over 30 years of connection um, in Papua New Guinea. Ted obviously uh, helps out with, with various things like mechanics while he's there and, and Joy with um, all sorts of education uh, type things. Um, but really they're there to connect with the Melanesian Churches of Christ um, who we support through various things like uh, training pastors, Bible translation, supporting the Bible College um, that's been operating over there for a number of decades since after the um, Second World War was the first connection in with Australian uh, churches with PNG. And so in all our projects, we're seeking to build these long-term connections. Um, and like I said, to get to know people in their context. Uh, we don't tend to send missionaries overseas since the 70s and this process of uh, indigenization of, of mission. Um, we don't tend to send missionaries overseas to do work. We tend to work with people who are already called and working um, to do things in the places that they that they work or that they live and uh, work already. Um, I'll give you a brief snapshot of a few of the different places that we we live and and hearing of the Chin connection here. I thought this would be a particularly interesting one because we work with a number of Chin people in Bangladesh um, who have come across the border from Burma and um, we were very lucky to have Vana Baum uh, come and stay with us. Uh, where's the photo? Here he is. He um, came to visit some churches in Australia just this last year now. Um, Ivan has um, been involved with the uh, outreach to um, ethnic minorities up in the hill tribes, up in uh, the Bundaban Hills, which is just near the Burma, uh, Burmese border. And um, he's, been, he's been working there for 10 years now. Um, in those 10 years, Ivan has planted 17 churches and uh, baptised over 920 members into those churches um, which is a very inspirational thing to hear about. I learned when he was here that the population of Chin people in Melbourne is um, the, sa the same number as the number of Chin people over in Burma and, and uh, Bangladesh. That was really interesting to know that the whole 50% um, are in Australia. Um, Barna was connecting with churches in Melbourne, um, really encouraging the younger Chin generation to... Um, take, take ownership of, of the story of, of migration and the struggles that they have um, and, and look at ways that they can support this church work back home. Um, these uh, hill tribes that Vana's reaching out to are uh, very difficult to get to, long journeys on, on boats and then trekking up into the, it's a bit like Mystic Mountain, um, trekking up into the hills. Um, and he talks about when he was here, he shared about um, connecting with people like being like a travel adapter, the sort of PowerPoint that you have to take when you go overseas. And he spoke about getting to know people so you can really plug into their lives, that you eat with them, that you learn to share in their food and their culture, um, because it's only then that when you can sit down beside them in friendship that you really discover ways to serve them and ways to speak, uh, speak good news into their lives. And the ways that they're doing that, and this is the ways um, Global Mission Partners are involved in supporting uh, various evangelists among these groups, uh, various church plants, but also um, projects such as uh, providing for children who are walking down out of the hills every weekend and to attend local government schools um, instead of having to walk 30 kilometres home every day. <laughs> Not that they were doing that. Um, 
to enable them to access these schools, which are a long walk from their houses to provide accommodation. Um, also things like um, establishing pharmacies, uh, for, and this is not the pharmacy, obviously, uh, but uh, pig farming, providing a sustainable income for families and the church. Um, the church gains a lot of their profits from pigs, so things like Christmas time, we have pigs for sale and our great gifts. You've probably seen similar things or may have seen it here, um, those sort of gift Christmas cards. So really looking at practical ways that we can serve uh, the community and the church overseas. I was lucky enough to go to Fiji this year and, and see the work of the Churches of Christ in Fiji. Um, this is one of the, the six, six or so churches that we support uh, ministry positions through. Uh, it's a very small um, Indian community in which we work in Fiji. Indians make up a, Fijian Indians make up about 30% of the population and they're very much a, an underclass. Very, uh, there's quite a lot of tension between the Fijians and the Indians. Fiji, yeah, the Fijians and the Indians. Um, and the Indians are, are often very poor communities, cane-cutting labourers. Um, so their churches are very much lacking resources. Uh, this uh, church rocked up and it was 25 degrees. It had been raining the night before. It was a very beautiful place to have church, but no one came because, because it was cold, 25 degrees, and, and it had been too muddy to get there. Um, but I thought it was quite ideal. Um, this church is looking to construct a new building and to give you an idea of the sorts of resources these uh, people have, this is one family who were contributing to the, uh, the cost of the building and they were able to purchase 17 bricks for the church. This man um, dries anchovy like little fish and sells them at market uh, for a living. So a lot of these families are very... Um, very poor, and, and so the work that we can contribute, even, even the small amount that we contribute there, uh, goes such a long way. Uh, this family um, visited a Hindu family owning a, only a vegetable uh, farm, and to give you an idea of the sorts of tensions in the community, um, this man was uh, travelling just down one of his back roads one day on his way to work, and um, there had been some Fijian people squatting on his land, and the idea of the Indians buying the land was certainly not appreciated and they broke his legs on his way to work. And so he was in hospital for a long time and this is the sorts of places that the local church is in getting uh, to connect with people, visiting them, to pray with them. And after the cyclone, uh, this is one of the families that we were able to provide um, some, some relief uh, to with tarpaulins and food. Um, so occasionally you'll see... Um, when there's a, a disaster like this, we'll, we'll have an a Australia-wide Churches of Christ uh, appeal. Um, so these are some of the places that that, that support gets to, to re, replanting the farm um, and doing that work through the local church that's connecting in with these people. All those stories, it's a very hopeful place, Fiji. Um, the church is very strong in prayer, um, very committed to... Um, transformative uh, the transformative life of the gospel and their unique witness within especially the Hindu community um, so it's a very heart heartful place if that's a word and uh, like I mentioned before a bit slightly closer to home is, is uh, some of the work in PG Indonesia and, and Vanuatu in these places especially the work with um, uh, translation and supporting Bible colleges uh, providing um, for the for the ministers and training over there, um, places like um, Indonesia as PNG, one of the challenges is low literacy, um, and so working in, in literacy type programs in Indonesia, one of the challenges is is connecting in with the Muslim community, which is the majority in Indonesia, and um, the the uh, college there that we support uh, students at. It's a requirement for those students to graduate in their ministry uh, to plant a church at the end of their three years of study. And to do that, they have to receive uh, 80 signatures from the local community before they're allowed to, before they're granted permission to meet as a church. Um, and so 80 signatures of the local Muslim population. It's very interesting that the way that they go about building the church is, is to do things that are of service to the local community so that they've got those connections and relationships. 
So some of them become hairdressers, some of them do English uh, classes, some of them help with brick making in, in some of the rural areas. Uh, all, all in the service of the local community so that uh, people really see the church as something very active that begins in serving people. And it's a very uh, refreshing reminder of, of what the church looks like in a community. So that's, I guess, the, um, the, the sorts of, of, um, of work that uh, your, your regular donation contributes to. Um, in 2017, we supported over 440 ministers overseas, um, just to give you a, size of, of a sense of the size of that. Um, and like I said, these connections enable us to respond in emergency situations. You may not have heard of the, the cyclone that went through Sorry, it wasn't a cyclone, the, um, the volcanic eruption. We heard of the one, I think, in Indonesia. At the same time, in November last year, there was one in uh, Vanuatu too, and this is one of our oldest connections um, with the Churches of Christ there. They were planted from the cane cutters who were brought over for labourers uh, in Queensland in the late 1800s and taken, taken back, and the church was planted. They didn't have Bibles, they didn't have literacy, but um, those cane cutters took one verse back to Vanuatu, and it was John 3.16. Um, and from that one verse, they planted, uh, planted the churches of Christ in Vanuatu. Uh, on the island of Ambe, there was the volcanic eruption. This is an island of 11,000 people, but there's 30 churches of Christ on that one island. It's quite an amazing little statistic. Um, and because of our connection in with the community, we're able to support um, various things like this, and it was great to see... Um, see the response to that appeal at the end of last year. Um, I got a quote uh, from, from uh, some of the people with the acid rain and the ash uh, falling in these farming communities, up to 70% of the crops were destroyed. And um, when the villagers finally got to uh, return back to the island, here's what one of them said. We heard from the people returned on Ambe that all of the dogs were waiting for them at the wharf where they left. They were all happy to see their dogs. The cattle and the pigs were gone. The chickens were dead, unfortunately, and yet they were still greeted with these happy dogs to see them. But that was quite a nice little story. So um, I'd encourage you to uh, really um, keep in touch with these stories. These are our collective family stories um, that can be quite inspirational. And we put out a monthly newsletter with uh, articles about mission, um, and sharing some of these stories. So I'll pass around a sign-up sheet now if you're interested just to, to have that news into your email. Um, also, um, all of our support comes from individuals and churches. Everything we do comes uh, from individual donations. So if you'd like to take a, an envelope, I'll pass them around too and consider contributing. That would be uh, most welcome. Uh, one, one other way to get involved coming up over Easter we're uh, running a national uh, Walk for Hope campaign the idea is to walk to church on Good Friday if you have a service or Easter Sunday if you do um, the sense of uh, uh, being, being the church that's walking through the community um, is something we like to uh, encourage um, if you're interested in, in challenging yourself um, having anyone sponsor you whether it's $5, $20, whatever um, to walk Set yourself a challenge, walk a kilometre, walk five kilometres or 20 if you like, um, or get together as a group and walk to church on Good Friday. I'll send some more information through to Warren this week if you're interested in uh, finding out about that, that little activity. So I'll just um, I'll share a very brief message with you this morning around the theme of of bravery. Um, I'll keep it under. Try and aim for eight minutes, see how we go. Because um, when, when we think about mission, often we think about mission in the context of bravery. We think about mission as um, this idea of, of brave individuals working on our behalf almost. We're comfortable here or out there as the brave work of missionaries or mission organisations who are doing all sorts of things, pushing out into the world and touching the untouched with the love of God. This sort of bravery seems very far away from our everyday lives. And uh, I want to shift your understanding a little bit, and, and starting with this image of a project 
Um, it really gets tucked away behind all our big headline projects. It's, it's projects at building uh, toilets for disabled people in Vietnam. And the bravery I want to explore is the bravery in this image, something which is like a toilet right in the middle of everyday life. Beginning with these words, which you've probably heard before. Then Jesus sent the twelve out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. In this passage, we really get the sense that mission follows the phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Is Jesus saying that mission needs a hardened face of bravery, heading off down a dusty track as the gritty, toughened faces of villagers stare back? This seems to be the case we get in all sorts of stories about mission. Mary Thompson, the first uh, overseas missionary within Churches of Christ, um, heading off by bullet cart into rural India on her own in the late 1800s. Or Doug Nichols, perhaps you've heard of him, another brave individual uh, playing for uh, Fitzroy, um, weathering boos of racist football fans, Doug went on to pioneer ministry and, and uh, minis- mission work in, in Footscray um, and then went on to become uh, governor of South Australia. He would have been a guy who could put on a tough face when he needed to. In all these stories of mission and the ones I've been sharing today, we hear about people who are heading out on the edge and we get this image of this, this sense of bravery from them. But an important question comes up and whenever we step out to do anything in our own lives I think this question will inevitably hit us in the face. Is a brave face enough to keep you going? Is a brave face enough to keep you going when day after day uh, governments push back against your every move? Is a brave face enough to keep you going when home and family are far away, or when there just isn't enough food or medicine. These things can become entirely overwhelming. In the end, I think a brave face doesn't cut it, and we are called to look for a deeper sort of confidence. A huge storm was smashing the disciples' boat. Suddenly, a figure appeared walking on the water, and they were afraid. Peter, putting on a brave face, stood up. He said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And he stepped off the side of the boat. But then he saw the wind and heard the almighty breath of God racing all around, and he felt weak. He was just a tiny speck of dust in a stormy world of destruction. Beginning to sink, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. When our brave faces melt away, Peter shows us a deeper source of confidence. Bravery that doesn't begin with a hardened edge, but bravery that begins with a softened, vulnerable heart. Jesus, the man of the edge, nowhere to lay his head, trudging down the dusty streets, eating with the outcasts of society. Jesus is also the softened, vulnerable heart of God. And this is where mission begins. The mission of God and our mission also. This is why we build toilets in Vietnam, not because it's ethical, not because it's popular, doesn't get us lots of likes on Facebook. So it's certainly not exciting. But the greatest adventure of all is to discover a living God 
who meets us in the middle of life, a living God who renews our hearts as we give ourselves in love and vulnerability. This is the bravery to know God's love in the midst of life. So when we hear Jesus' instructions, take nothing with you for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, do we think of the phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going? Or do we hear these words as they are about dependence? Take nothing with you on the journey. But for the humble confession on your lips, this is my body broken for you. When war, famine, hatred, loss, hardship and hopelessness, these real things of life, when these things threaten, real courage begins in vulnerability. Not in our strength, but in a loving God of life who gives in abundance to those who trust in him. I think if we're brave enough to begin here, the adventure will just take care of itself. Let's pray. Loving God of life, the life that gives itself in love, that comes amongst us in friendship, that sits beside us in the dust. Give us confidence to live after you. Give us confidence to follow your example, to trust in vulnerability, in the love of God, who generously gives life. Give us the courage to to become dependent and to become vulnerable to those amongst us. To know what it is to step out and to sit down with compassion and hope. Take us on an adventure and show us into life. Amen.